Hello there, today I will be discussing how our dietary choices impact upon the environment, especially vegan and vegetarian choices. The inspiration comes from Professor Sarah Bridal of the University of Manchester. I heard her speak passionately and clearly on this topic on the radio, and then I've subsequently bought her book, Food and Climate Change Without the Hot Air, which you can see referenced on, on the left here in the picture of it. Um, it was a bit naughty of me, but I did decide to buy a hard copy of the book, which I had delivered to my door in a big van by Amazon Prime. But hopefully by spreading the word today and having some people listen to this, I'll be able to offset some of that damage that I've done. Hopefully it will also help me to address some of my dietary uh, decisions, thinking about some of the choices I make and perhaps improving those decisions. And I'd like to thank Sarah for allowing me to use her content and her graphics in order to, to make some of these points today. Right, before we go further, it's probably worth noting and making clear that meat and animal product consumption is generally speaking worse for the environment than plant-based food. Two or three percent of the global population is 100% vegan and vegetarian, although those figures are quite difficult to come by. And about two thirds of uh, vegan and vegetarians are probably women. There's also a growing trend towards being a flexitarian uh, or a casual vegetarian or, or a semi-vegetarian, um, whereby you might reduce your meat consumption. So a question that springs to mind is why do people choose a vegetarian or a vegan diet? Well, the top two reasons highlighted in blue here, and these do relate to people who are 100% vegan or vegetarian, are one, to protect the climate, and two, for animal welfare reasons. Now, the other reasons here are probably going to relate more to the flexitarian people and might link to health, and particularly uh, avoiding uh, red meat, perhaps to some extent, uh, also about cost, because of course dairy and meat products are going to be quite expensive, um, and also religious reasons and, and many, many other reasons that people will have. The focus here then is on the link between our food and the environment, protection of it and climate change links. In short, our food emissions are far too high due to our food choices and the production processes that go on. The graph shows on the left here that average global emissions for food um, of about six kilograms of CO2 per day per person. That, of course, will vary quite a lot depending on which country people live in um, and how wealthy they are, and also vary from individual to individual based on their food choices. Sarah Bridal suggests that halving our emissions to about three kilograms of CO2 per day would be a suitable and achievable target. But it does occur to me, though, that actually it's the richer people in the world who should bear the brunt of this responsibility. It is difficult to ask many of our world's poorer people to make significant changes. Not everybody has got significant freedom in making dietary choices. Perhaps therefore I'm committing myself to some changes in terms of the amount of meat I eat and the amount of dairy products that I consume. Let's try and contextualise this figure of six kilograms per person per day, which is, is our um, average food consumption. Um, which is, and that's shown here on the right. Um, and let's compare it to what's shown on the left. So this column on the left shows the CO2, the carbon dioxide, which is released by taking a return transatlantic flight of 10,000 kilometres. And that's divided here over uh, by 365 days. In other words, this one trip causes 3,000 kilograms of emissions per person. And we can draw our own conclusions from that. One conclusion I might make is we probably need to think about not flying so much. There are those schemes, of course, designed to offset such emissions and how taxes and charges and things should be used to lower emissions um, is an interesting topic and one which I'll touch on uh, later in this video. But back to diets. Different diets, of course, cause different levels of climate impact. Food is responsible for about a third of all human-induced anthropogenic climate change. This is because fossil fuel consumption and diet are very closely linked. Vegetarians, on average, typically cause 40% fewer emissions due to their diet compared to a typical omnivore diet. Vegans, the figure is even better, about 50% 
of an omnivore diet. Right, let's talk ham sandwich versus cheese sandwich. Now, the classic assumption here is that the meat product, i.e. the ham, will be more environmentally damaging. But as you can see from these figures, uh, which are taken from Sarah's book, uh, you can see that the cheese is actually worse in many cases. These figures assume 80 grams of bread, 2 teaspoons of butter and 50 grams of ham or cheese. The cheese and ham toasty figures are, as far as we're concerned for this video, here for, for general interest. Sarah talks about this in more detail um, in her book. Let's address the cheese first. Cows, or other common alternatives like sheep, goats, buffalo, produce lots of methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. 10 kilograms of milk is needed to make one kilogram of cheese. As far as the ham is concerned, pigs do produce greenhouse gases, and actually that's mostly where their poo and their wee is stored up in a big slurry pit, waiting to be um, spread on the fields later. In doing that means it can't rot down using oxygen and therefore methane is created, which is bad. So what about alternatives to cheese and ham? Well, as we can see, uh, just underneath here, um, these numbers, especially for cheese, take up a large chunk of our three kilograms of CO2 per day target. Switching cheese um, to, say, a nut butter typically reduces emissions by five times. And an environmentally friendly version here uh, to ham is going to be corn. It's also worth noting that working out the emissions of say a slice of ham actually is quite complex. Linked to this, if we use all of the pig, it's much more environmentally friendly. If we use byproducts efficiently, then the environmental cost is minimized. For example, a byproduct of ham is going to be pig's blood, which is used in black pudding. Right, most of our milk comes from cows. We've touched on this already, but essentially cows have four stomach compartments. The first is called the rumen. Here, bacteria produce methane in a process called enteric fermentation. Other animals that do this are sheep, goats, deer, moose, giraffes. They're all called ruminants. Milk is easier to work out in terms of climate impact. Basically, Sarah explains in her book that dairy milk uh, causes about double the climate impact than plant milk does. When we talk about plant milk, we mean oat milk, almond milk, uh, coconut milk, rice milk, and so on. No one plant milk is, is much better than, or worse than any other um, plant milk in terms of environmental impact, except when we start to dig down into the production methods, the packaging and the transportation distance and type and so on. So we're gonna do some milk testing and rating now. There isn't much of a rigorous scientific approach here, a um, bit more fun than that, uh, but I have had a go at some rating, some testing, and ultimately ranking some of these milks. I've looked at prices, as you can see in this table. Um, I've thought about uh, the distance travel, but to be fair, this actually essentially becomes uh, a score based on how well the packaging gives me this information. I haven't dug too deep. Um, so it may or may not be unfair. I've also then looked at taste in tea over the last few days, and the scores are on here. Um, but, and then I will also be doing uh, now um, tasting these milks on their own, uh, just in a, a wine glass. Um, and this hopefully will produce a winner if I can get the maths correct. So we'll start off with this first column. Um, so the oat milk, we're referring to cost in Tesco's, uh, and per litre, and there is um, the range of, of prices in Tesco at the top, then the one that I've bought, and then the rating. So it, it is between a pound and two pound fourteen for oat milk uh, in Tesco, and uh, the one we bought was one pound fifty, um, which I gave that a score of two out of five. In terms of distance travelled, there was very little information here. We did get some information uh, on this oat milk oat milk package um, about um, the carbon footprint which is uh, here and it gives a, a source there as being a carbon cloud for that information as being 0.35 kilograms of co2 uh, per kilogram of uh, oat milk um, so i gave that some credit for having that information and then the tea taste um, is pretty creamy the tea uh, very acceptable as a as a what i'm used to as a cow milk substitute this is the oat milk on its own. Uh, 
and that's fine. I think I prefer cow milk, but that's okay. Let's go for a score of four there. Not particularly well drawn. Okay, four for that one then. Um, now, moving on to almond milk. Uh, there's the range of, of prices again at the top um, for the cost in Tesco. This is one pound eighty, so slightly more expensive. <coughs> the information I got from this packet was that these almonds were grown in the Mediterranean. Rain-fed almonds, suggesting a lack of irrigation required. Um, we've also got um, plant-based packaging being emphasised on, on, on the carton itself. So I gave this a score of four out of five. As far as the tea goes, now this may become unfair because I don't particularly, I guess, like the taste of almonds. It does taste like almonds as far as the tea was concerned, so I gave this two out of five. So here we go again. Put some in my wine glass. It's not as bad as I thought it might be, actually. It, it, it tastes of almonds. Obviously, it tastes of almonds. It's okay. It's okay. Um, I think I prefer the oat milk. Um, so we're going to go three for that one. Soya milk. Next one along. So this was a pound, and there's a quite a big range in Tesco. Three out of five for that one. There's no information on the packet this time. Perhaps, again, unfair because it's Tesco's kind of own brand, this one. Um, so no particular information given there, so I gave that zero. In the tea though, actually there wasn't much of a strong flavour, slightly odd aftertaste possibly, um, so I gave that a three out of five. Now, it smells quite distinctive, and that's okay. Yeah, I'm going to go the same as oat milk, I think. I'm going to give that a four. Okay. Right, hemp. I'm slightly worried about hemp because I did not enjoy the tea. Right, hemp, two out of five uh, for the cost. Uh, that was £1.50. It is from Devon in the, U in the UK. So that is really well um, signposted on their carton where it came from, which is great. Um, tasting tea, no, I just thought... That is not nice at all. That is a really weird flavour. Didn't enjoy it. Um, I might have over poured there because I'm not. I'm, I'm already worried about how this is going to taste. <sighs> yeah, I don't like that. One again. It's just not that great. It's, it's got an aftertaste and it's not pleasant, it's not pleasant. I'm not gonna be buying that again. <coughs> oh dear. Right, so cow's milk then, and it's difficult to judge cow's milk, isn't it? Because I've grown up with cow's milk, I'm preconditioned to think that is milk. That's the milk I've always drunk. So it's got top score in terms of price because it is the cheapest by a significant distance. The carton, just says British farms, so I thought, yeah, okay, that's okay. It's certainly not been flown anywhere, uh, probably. Uh, so four out of five. Um, I've given it five out of five for tasting tea because that is, well, that's the benchmark. Cow's milk is the benchmark. Um, and then taste on its own. Well, again, it's the benchmark taste, isn't it? So what can I do but put a number five on there? So let's do the maths. So two and two more uh, gives us four. Plus four is eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I reckon that is twelve out of twenty for oat milk. We've then got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten for almond milk. Ten. Soya is going to be three and four is seven, eight, nine, ten again for soya. Hemp is going to be seven, eight, uh, seven, eight, nine. Uh, that's going to come in one lower. And therefore, we've got just one mark taken off, a big 19 for cow milk. Um, and of course, that is really the control, that's just to compare it against. So that we can take that one out, can't we? And that is not really part of this test. So the overall winner um, from those, I put in inverted commas, milks, which are 
and those are far better for the environment than the cow's milk. The winner, I'm going to give that to oat milk. So congratulations to oat milk, the champion of this test. So who should decide what I eat? Well, let's first look at the possible food scenarios in terms of their emissions. As you can see on the left hand side here, uh, we've got three scenarios. I won't go through the details, but if you do want to look at this more closely, then do pause here um, for a closer look and go through some of the breakdowns. The key ideas are that meat, closely followed by dairy, will push up your food emissions significantly. Secondly, air flown perishable food like strawberries and raspberries are going to create loads and loads of emissions. So how and who is going to influence the food choices that we make? Well, first and foremost, of course, perhaps, we all need to take individual responsibility for understanding the food that we put inside our bodies. Children may not have complete control over their diet uh, whilst they grow, but they should inform themselves so as to make good decisions in the future. Watching this video and reading Sarah's book and doing our own research is all part of this. I'm certainly not suggesting any person can't have a cheese sandwich, can't have a steak dinner or can't go to KFC, but I am suggesting that you should try to understand the processes involved in producing this food as much as you can. Should food producers, should governments help us to make good decisions? Well, this is quite a complex area. And of course, some companies and even some governments can sometimes give imperfect advice. That said, they have a significant role to play in aiding positive change. They can improve food labeling so that, for example, I want, I want to know if my fruit has come into the country uh, on a boat or if it's come on an aeroplane. That way I can make an informed choice about whether I want it or not. Then, of course, there's taxation, um, which can influence decision making. In 2016, the UK government announced a sugar tax on very sugary drinks, which came into force in 2018, by which time some drinks producers had reduced sugar so as to avoid that tax. This is the reason why some diet drinks are cheaper. This also works with plastic. In 2014, the UK government imposed a plastic bag charge, which led to an 80% reduction in plastic bag use. These schemes do do work. But some people think that government can interfere too much, um, and that's possibly true. A meat tax has been suggested, but this would be pretty unpopular with many people, certainly initially. Sarah suggests that governments um, have got a role to play in nudging us into the right direction. A further word though at this point on the responsibility that companies have in educating and guiding us. I bought this beer here uh, from the Brewdog company. Um, in truth, I bought it mostly because actually it was on offer in Morrison's and I, I quite like it. Um, but their packaging, um, I knew before, but also I have I've now taken a closer look at through making this video. Uh, their packaging and their messaging is quite extraordinary. They claim their beer to be the world's first carbon negative beer. Um, and they can even have some comments on the side uh, that talk about, you can see them here, uh, just there. Uh, they talk about water usage, they talk about sustainable power sources and their reforestation schemes. I'm um, highlighting these points should of course be applauded. Um, now having discussed Brewdog, as I say, I do like their beer. Um, having discussed them, I want to be clear that my next point, my next points, aren't aimed at Brewdog or any particular company, um, because that isn't the point of what I'm trying to achieve in this video. I want to highlight the concept of greenwashing, of companies adding what we would call a green sheen to their products. This is a type of marketing that companies do to appear to be more environmentally aware, more environmentally, environmentally friendly than they really are. Um, often highlighted for criticism would be fast food chains uh, that might run green schemes, whilst at the same time they'll be chopping down uh, the rainforest for cattle farms, or perhaps of coffee chains um, that will be um, handing out single-use cups um, that can litter the countryside and will fill bins. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. Do please refer to the link uh, or two I put into the um, description and also the timestamps you'll find there. Uh, which I'll add in for future reference and for ease of access to the various parts of this video. Thank you so much as well to Sarah Bridal 
uh, for producing her brilliant book and for allowing me to use the content and the graphics uh, in order to make some of these points. Do refer to this book if you want to know more. There's loads of other stuff in there. You can look at things about uh, pizza and potatoes and beer and wine, fish and chips and, and loads of other things. Uh, there's also some really clear explanations and graphics all about um, the science of climate change. So thank you very much. Hope that's been of use and I'll see you in the next video.